The first song this evening will be number 526. Following the song, Brother Josh will lead our minds in our opening prayer. Number 526. From all the dark places of earth's heathen race, oh, see how the thick shadows fly. The voice of salvation awakes every nation. Come over and help us, they cry. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story. God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. The sunlight is glancing, or armies advancing to conquer the kingdoms of sin. Our Lord shall possess them, his presence shall bless them, his beauty shall enter them in. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. With praising and singing and jubilant ringing, their arms of rebellion cast down. At last every nation, the Lord of salvation, the King and Redeemer shall crown. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here tonight. We thank you that we could sing these songs of praise and lift up these prayers in your name. Father, we pray that you bless this service. We want to give you all the honor and the glory that you deserve, Lord. And use us up in that endeavor. Help us to be good Christians when we leave this house. Help us to make more Christians in the way that we live and the way that we talk. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you'd like to mark your song books, song of invitation this evening, following the lesson will be number 668. 668. Psalm before the lesson will be number 713. Number 713. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. A guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measured loves and strong. It shall forever more endure the singing angel's song. When o'er time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rose and hill and mountains call. God's love so pure shall still endure a measure loss and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race 
the saint and angels song. O Lamb of God, how rich and pure, how measured love and strong. It shall forever endure the saint and angels song. Could we with him the ocean fill and were the sky? A punishment made where every star on earth a quill and every lamb ascribed by dream who write the love of God above will drink the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole. Though stretched from sky to sky, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measured love and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. I had not heard that song. It was written by Mary Slade, though. You all are very familiar with Mary Slade. She wrote my favorite invitation song, There's a Fountain Free, it is for you and me. She wrote a whole lot of other songs you'd be familiar with, with too. Footsteps of Jesus, Beyond This Land of Parting. Uh, I've heard that song before. I've sang it. I've okay, well, that's Mary Slade. I could go on and on. Uh, that last song you sang, uh, the third and last stanza, is just amazing. Uh, the words to that, do you know where the words of that came from? When this fella penned this song, uh, he had been to a revival meeting. So many times our songs come from a sermon, and he heard the sermon quote that poem at the end of the sermon. And uh, he said that the name of the man, he went to his grave. We have no idea who he is who wrote that little poem, but it was found in an insane asylum on the wall under the man's bed. Isn't that amazing? Yes, hymn stories, Joel, are fascinating. I am forever fascinated by them. I have more books on hymn stories than anybody that I know. I've got a bunch of them. If you're ever interested in them, let me know. You could probably go in there and take them, and I'd never miss them. But uh, I buy every one I can, and most of them are the same, but every once in a while you'll find discrepancies in the stories, which tells you our hymns take upon themselves uh, some sort of legendary status, and legends begin to grow around them. And it's interesting, I like to sleuth around and see if I can't get to the root of the uh, of the problem and find the real story and sometimes I'll be bogged down in a quagmire for months but uh, there's times you have to let it go I guess but uh, no I had never heard that first song but I guess we've sang it here but we know of Mary Slade's work uh, we know of it very well all right uh, let me look at the time 610 if I quit at 630 510 15, 20 minutes, there you go. Uh, I may just go to 6.50, make it 40 minutes. I like to have men come up here and do gospel meetings. I love it when they go an hour. I like to remind you how spoiled you are. <laughs> so, but uh, I think a 20 minute sermon, Guy and Wood said if you can't say what you gotta say in 20 minutes, you haven't prepared. Uh, but there again, he got in the habit of where he'd go and speak for 20 minutes and then have a question and answer at each meeting for two hours. So 
Uh, he, he got his speaking out. Laura said the sermon was real good this morning. She said, it's amazing how good you sound when you quiet down and slow down. So, so uh, maybe I just learned a new secret to this thing. Uh, what will you do with Jesus was the question we asked today. And I wanted to consider a few of the people that were confronted with that question in the Bible. The first being Caiaphas. Are you familiar with Caiaphas? In Matthew 26, Matthew 26 and verse 65, we read, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Now, this is a picture or a window. Uh, by the way, we have Carson with us tonight. Carson is a twin, and I asked him if it's cool to be twins, and he said, no, it's not. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm going to tell Laura that. Uh, of course, she, she may be listening. Uh, my twins are getting fat. I mean, their cheeks are getting out there. They look like little chipmunks. And uh, they, 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 they only eat about two ounces at a time, but they eat every two and a half to three hours. And then they spit it up. And so you never know what they're going to do. But uh, Laura said, last night I told you wrong. I said she hadn't slept for days. She said last night they let her sleep for about six or seven hours. So... Uh, that was good. I slept through it all, so something to think about. Excuse me. If I make a bunch of noises tonight, I apologize. I sound uh, like one of those hogs. Caiaphas was the high priest. Joseph Caiaphas. We learn his name from Josephus. As a matter of fact, we learn a great deal about him from Josephus. I wish I could give you about it. Uh, 45 minutes on the history of Caiaphas tonight. I think that you would find it fascinating, but I'm not going to go that long. He, uh, he, uh, his high priesthood lasted from 18 to 37 A.D. So, <coughs> so from 18 to 37, that's half the life of Jesus. And he lived uh, a few years after Jesus. We believe that Jesus was born somewhere around 4 BC. And so for the majority of Jesus' adult life, Caiaphas is the high priest. And he played a key role in the trial and execution of Jesus. And that's where this verse comes from, the trial of Jesus. They're trying to get witnesses to confirm that Jesus had committed blasphemy. And of course, the high priest, Caiaphas, gets what he wants out of Jesus. He rinse his clothes in our verse. You see, he's a very pious man. What did it mean to rent your clothes? Why did he tear his clothes? Well, because it was blasphemy and it was something that was vulgar. And so in the presence of something vulgar, he rips his clothes. Uh, before this, we read in another passage that he beat his chest. And uh, it's a sign of, uh, well, it really is as we uh, can tell very quickly, a dramatic license is what I would call it. He played a key role, though, in the trial. Caiaphas's family tomb has been found uh, several kilometers below the old city of Jerusalem. Now, it's fascinating. In 1990, they found a rock-hewn burial cave, and uh, it contained a dozen ossuaries. Do you know what an ossuary is? I think that I've explained it to you before. You'll have to go back and look at your notes. Uh, an ossuary is a box, a limestone box. And you find them in Jerusalem. And they came, find it uh, uh, humorous that the, there is a uh, elaborate uh, sale on coffins in America at any given time, at any, at any, any given week. but. Uh, ossuaries were the way that people buried their loved ones. And so you would go into a cave and there would be a hole, a niche 
N-I-C-H-E, with that squiggly line above the E. And it would go back far enough that it could fit a man's body. Or, as it was in most cases during the time of Christ, there would have been just a platform that lay here. One platform on each side, and then there would be several niches in the wall that held ossuaries. And so you would bury somebody, and then you would come back on the anniversary of their death a year later. And by that time, all their flesh is rotted away, and all that is left is bones. And the family would gather those bones and put them in this little limestone box that is called an ossuary. And then they would put them in those niches. And the niches were about three feet back into the stone, into the limestone, which is what you find all over Jerusalem, which was good because you can carve limestone. It's soft enough. And they would carve back in there, and then they would take a plaster, and they would cover the hole. And uh, many times there would be, uh, they have excavated graves, and then uh, they'd been walking around in there and uh, realized that there was a false floor below them and found a whole another room full of these type of graves. But this was the case with Caiaphas's tomb. And they find it in 1990. And two of the boxes were inscribed with the name Caiaphas. And the most beautifully decorated one had Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Inside were the bones of a man who had died around the age of 60. So he's in his late 50s or early uh, 60s when he is trying Jesus. He would be considered an old man at that time. These are believed, and most scholars would affirm, they are the remains of the Caiaphas of the Bible, the very high priest who sent Jesus to his death. Now, what was curious about that, and I was there in 1995, and I could not see these uh, uh, bones, but I could see the ossuary. Uh, well, a uh, copy of it in the Jerusalem Museum. I was fascinated by that because these are believed, they believe the remains of Caiaphas, and these bones would constitute the first physical remains of a biblical person ever discovered, and they've never found another. The only physical remains of any biblical character that has ever been found is Caiaphas. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? The bones uh, are in that ossuary, and they were put back into the original grave. The Jews are very, uh, well, uh, they look at death and the remains of uh, the dead and they take it very seriously in Israel, uh, very seriously. And so if you find any remains and you excavate a tomb, after you've categorized everything, those remains must be put back in that tomb and that tomb must be sealed. And you can go there today, it's in kind of a posh neighborhood and you'd never even know it's there, it's on a hill. And the only thing that gives you any indication that it's there is a pipe that's coming up out of the ground for air. And uh, under that pipe is, uh, is the ossuaries and the, the tomb for all, uh, well, it's, it, it would look like it's, if you dug it back up, it would look like it's been undisturbed. And so what's amazing about the Jews, they have such a peculiar way of handling bodies. When there is a bombing that goes off in Israel, there is a special team, an elite team that comes in and they scour the area and they find every piece of body that they can. And they, by the way, they've, they've led the world in uh, DNA and identification because the body is very, they consider the body to be sacred, okay? And so uh, that's why Herod is back in his tomb and there he rests. But it's just an amazing thing that, uh, that his tomb was found. The uh, there's kind of a controversy that goes along with Caiaphas. Have you heard about this? I think I mentioned this to you once. Do you know what they found with his, in this ossuary? You all don't remember this? Maybe I didn't tell you. Can anybody guess what was found in there? 
Anybody want to take a guess? Well, it's almost like an Indiana Jones thing, man. Uh, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, I'm going to see if I could throw this up here. I got a link. Um, <coughs> doesn't seem to be. Oh, there it is. Did it come up? Okay. Let me see what I can find here. Let's see if I can do this right. There we are. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, you can see that. Let's take a better look. Now, do you want to take a guess what they found? It's like back to your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Cell phone. <laughs> yeah, Caiaphas' cell phone. Now, this is from the Jerusalem Post. Spike? Yes, they found a spike. They found two, to be exact. Now that is not what they found. This is called clickbait. But this was found years ago. This, well, it, it isn't any longer, but for the majority of my life, this was the only evidence we had of anyone who had ever been crucified. I saw that in the Jerusalem Museum, and it wasn't a copy. Uh, they were cleaning, and uh, I opened the door. I said, what are you guys cleaning in here today? He said, well, we're cleaning one of our most famous pieces. And uh, they said it was the crucified bone. And I said, may I see that? And they let me come in there and look at that. I got to do the same thing for the Isaiah scroll, by the way. But, uh, but uh, you guys aren't interested in that. So this is the only evidence of a crucified person. But now they've found another one since I was there. By the way, they've also found the real pool of Siloam. When I was there, I looked at a fake one. So things are always changing with biblical archaeology. Ere Sharon found out that the nails were the same ones taken from Caiaphas's site and were also used to crucify someone and they have bone in them. So in the early 90s, uh, when this thing was excavated, uh, the original archeological uh, papers on it indicated that within the ossuary, there were a few things that were found, but the most peculiar thing that was found was two nails. Two nails. And then, when they went to look at uh, the findings, those two nails were nowhere to be found. And so, investigators got on it, and for 20 years, no one could find the nails. And they made a movie about it, and someone found nails, and then they examined the residue on the nails with the residue in the ossuary, and it linked up perfectly, so they knew they had found the nails from the ossuary, and just recently, this is from, I believe, 2020. Yes, October 28, 2020. Uh, just recently, he says that these were the nails that were taken from Caiaphas', uh, Caiaphas site, and they were used to crucify someone. They have bone in them, and they have wood. Here he says, fragments of the nails believed to have been used in crucifixion have ancient wood and fragments of bone in them, according to the new study, the New York Post reported. And so that's from the Jerusalem Post and from the New York Post. Now, isn't that amazing? They find Caiaphas's tomb, and here he has two nails in his ossuary. Why would he have those? I don't know I stopped mirroring, did I? I may have just messed everything up, Tom. Why do you think he'd have those? Where do you think the nails came from? I mean, it's hard not to think that, isn't it? Uh, well, there would be fragments of bone found along uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the nail. No, no, they didn't find. That picture is not the one they found. All they found was two nails. And so fragments are things, of course, that happen when you go through sinew or anything. And so what it is is there is organic material on, that, on those nails and wood and so what they have is and then it comes up missing for all these years 
And then with pressure being applied, it mysteriously comes up. By the way, they found it in a museum uh, way in the back, categorized in a place it shouldn't even been. It makes you wonder what was going on. But why would he have those there? Have we stopped now? No, we still haven't. I may not be able to stop mirroring, Tom. We may be in trouble. I'll turn my iPad off. How about that? Oops, I don't know how to do that. There we go. Well, I just lost my sermon. But if it was the bones of Jesus, or the, excuse me, the uh, nails of Jesus, he seems to have believed that they were some kind of talisman. Why would he be buried with such a thing? Or did someone who buried him place some bones that had been driven through a human being with wooden splinters, did someone put them in there as a way of sort of sticking it to him? I don't know. I told you that it was bizarre, didn't I? And it, that worked. But, uh, okay. But truth is stranger than fiction, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if those are the nails that were placed in Jesus. As a matter of fact, I believe that if the Catholic Church thought they were, they'd have them by now. But there's something. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Caiaphas, what will you do with Jesus? Am I back on? No, good. Are you guys back on? Okay. And I've lost my sermon. I'm ready to quit. How long have I gone? Okay. All right. We're back. I thought I'd show you that. I thought that'd be interesting. We had just paused for station identification. And, uh, and, and now we're back. Uh, Caiaphas accused Jesus of blasphemy, which was a crime that was punishable by death uh, under Jewish law. Now, for the life of me, I, I, I can't explain uh, and I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard my good brethren preach, and they would say that uh, the Jews needed Rome to kill Jesus because they didn't have the authority to kill him. Have you ever heard preachers preach that? Because I heard it for years. And, uh, and uh, I remember asking Gene West that. I heard him preach it. And uh, he said, yes, uh, Josh, uh, he was so good. He, he would say to me, he, he would encourage my questions. And he would say, yes, Josh, the Jews did not have the power. And uh, I didn't say anything. And he said, Josh, you don't seem to agree with me. And I would say, Gene, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say much. He said, say what you must say. And uh, I said, well, how could they stone Stephen? And uh, how could they have the ability to kill so many early Christians by writ of the Sanhedrin? And uh, he said, you know the answer, don't you? And so I took him Alfred Eldersheim's book, and I gave him the laws on it. I also have the Talmud, and so I know how this is. They could kill anybody that they wanted to kill. Okay, if they gave them a trial and they were found guilty, they could stone them to death. Uh, they could, they could, I suppose, come up with whatever way they wanted to kill them, except one way. We say crucifixion, yes, but uh, crucifixion is just one of the ways under an umbrella term, and the umbrella term is found in Deuteronomy, it is cursed for a man to hang on a tree. And so anyone who would take a rope and hang them on a limb, that's cursed. Anyone who would take a rope and hang a man to crucify him on a tree or on a post, again, that would fall under that. Anyone who would take nails and drive them to a man to hang him on the tree or hang him on uh, a, uh, uh, some kind of gallows that have been made would be 
cursed. And the Jews could not do that. It was against the law for them to do that. Now, what does that say about the vehement hate that they had for Jesus? They had him on blasphemy. Okay? They could have killed him. They could have drug him out of the Sanhedrin and stoned him to death right there. But they wanted to make an example. They wanted Jesus to die, yes, but they wanted him to die a cursed death, which would bring a curse or a reproach on all of his followers also. It's uh, very interesting to me that when we look into all the laws that were broke by Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, it's uh, little wonder that, uh, that they come up with the charges that they do. Caiaphas accused him of blasphemy. The Sanhedrin, or the high council of which Caiaphas was president, didn't have the authority to crucify people, so Caiaphas turned him over to the Roman governor, Pilate who would carry out that death sentence. Now Caiaphas tried to uh, convince Pilate that Jesus was a threat to Roman stability and had to die to prevent a rebellion. <coughs> now Caiaphas had some strengths, okay? Caiaphas led the Jewish people in their worship. He performed no doubt his religious duties in strict adherence or obedience to the Mosaic law. But Caiaphas is known as a weak man. His weaknesses are many. It's questionable whether Caiaphas was appointed high priest because of his own merit. Uh, we read of Annas. Who was Annas? Well, if you know your Gospels, Annas was Caiaphas' father-in-law. Now, if you know anything about a high priest, High priests served till they were dead. Annas had been the high priest, but yet we read of him functioning. What was he doing? He wasn't the high priest, but he was still in some way counseling Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest. He becomes the high priest probably around 30 years of age, and he seems to keep his position till uh, he's about around 60 years of age. But Annas, his father-in-law, who was the high priest before him, had got five of his relatives appointed to that office. Isn't that interesting? Nepotism. Yes, I was going to quote Lincoln on nepotism, but I won't. In John 18, 13, we see Annas playing a major part in Jesus' trial, an indication that he may have advised or controlled Caiaphas even after Annas was disposed. Three high priests were appointed and quickly removed by the Roman governor, uh, Valerius Gracchus, before Caiaphas, which suggests, I think, that he was a shrewd collaborator with the Romans. He was in there for 30 years. He was doing something right as far as the Romans were concerned, wasn't he? You must remember, below the Roman, the, the Roman governor of Judea, the high priest was the second most powerful man in all of Israel. And so Jesus is taken before the two most powerful men in all of Israel, and Caiaphas is number two. As a member of the Sadducees, Caiaphas didn't believe in the resurrection. What seemed to make Caiaphas so angry is the timing. What happened the week right before Jesus is crucified that has to do with the resurrection? Yeah. John 11. What happens in John 11? Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is raised from the grave. And here is Caiaphas, the second most powerful man in Israel. He's part of the Sanhedrin. And he does not believe in the resurrection because he's a Sadducee. And here the whole town is stirred up. Because Jesus has raised Lazarus. We can't have that, especially the week of Passover, can we? I think he preferred to destroy this challenge to his belief instead of supporting it. And since Caiaphas oversaw the temple, he was aware of the money changers. 
the animal sellers who were driven out by Jesus, I imagine Caiaphas had probably received a few bribes from those money changers in times past. Well, I might go too far there. But according to the scriptures, Caiaphas was not interested in the truth. His trial of Jesus violated Jewish law and was rigged to produce a guilty verdict. And perhaps he saw Jesus as a menace to Roman order. But he also may have seen this new message as a threat to his family's rich way, rich way of life. And maybe it haunted him. And maybe that's why those two nails were in that ossuary. Would the old owl say? The world may never know, right? What did Caiaphas do with the question, what shall we do with Jesus? He made a fool of himself. Maybe next week we'll look at uh, another character, Judas Iscariot. But we can learn a lot from Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the religious leader of the day. He had a chance to lead his nation as many great high priests had. He could have brought reform. He could have seen what Jesus had been doing and accepted him. But he wasn't happy with the status quo being shook up. What killed Jesus? Well, in a word, treason. The Romans would never crucify him for blasphemy. They could care less if some Judean blasphemed their duty in God. It meant nothing to the Romans. But for the high priest of the Jews to go to Pilate and tell him that here we have a man that is stirring up the people who is causing insurrection and is a nuisance to Rome who needs to die, the verdict was treason. And the most sickening words that you read of in the Bible are from those Jews who say, we have no king but Caesar. I wonder how those words tasted in his mouth. Because his people hated Caesar. But it tells you they hated Jesus more. They hated Jesus more. And so there's a lesson tonight. Again, what will you do with Jesus? Won't you come as we stand and sing? Come to Jesus, he will save you. For your sin has crimson glow. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to me. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come to me. Come to Jesus, do not tarry, enter in at mercy's gate. Oh, delay not till the morrow, lest I come in be too late. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, Come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come, come to him. Come to Jesus, dying sinner. Other Savior, there is none. He will share with you his glory when your pilgrim age is done. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. 
Come to Jesus, come, come today.